Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right, this is the first video in a series of videos on Swiss cheese and wine. So back in December, I got a random email out of the blue about sampling Gruyere cheese. It touted that real Gruyere cheese must come from Switzerland. Switzerland? So I'll admit, I really didn't know it was a Swiss cheese. I thought it was French. I mean, it's a French word, right? You know, it makes sense. And the part of Switzerland it comes from is the French speaking part of the country. Switzerland has three main languages, French, Italian, and German. These areas correspond to the countries that border Switzerland. In addition to France to the west, Italy to the south, and Germany to the north, you have Liechtenstein and Austria to the east. But wait, isn't there a fourth official language? Yep, Romance. It's a direct descendant from Latin and is spoken mostly in the southeast part of the country, the canton of Graubuden. When it comes to cheese in general, I'm pretty ignorant of the category. I know it comes from milk from different animals, specifically cows, buffalo, I tend to forget this one, uh, sheep and goats, and it's somehow magically made into cheese. Technically, any animal that produces milk, aka a mammal, can be the source of cheese. But these are the animals we associate and breed for milk. Kind of like how most people know wine comes from grapes. I kind of had the same view about cheese. Though a wine can come from any fruit, we classify it as coming from grapes and specify the fruit if not from grapes. So what is cheese anyway and how is it made? Let's find out together. First, you need milk. Like I said, the milk can come from any source, but the reason we use animals like cows, buffalo, sheep, and goats is, well, twofold. First, they are part of a class of animals called ruminant. These are the animals that, quote, rechew their food. Essentially, they have two stomachs. The front stomach ferments what they ate, and then they regurgitate it and then rechew it, and then it goes back into the back stomach to finish digesting. The second essential element is using animals that can be easily domesticated, like cows, sheep, and goats. Sheep are one of the first animals to be domesticated. Other ruminant animals like giraffes, deer, gazelles, and antelopes are much harder to domesticate. Uh, check out this video from CGP Gray on why zebras are terrible horses. The link is below. Side note, there is some debate about the lack of ease of domesticating zebra, but the majority of the video seems to stand up. There's a companion video about plagues you should also check out. Somehow, early humans at least 8,000 years ago discovered that milk would curdle when stored in animal skins, typically from internal organs like, well, stomachs, as in those from ruminants. Kind of like how we figured out how to make beer and wine by seeing things like breads and fruit juice go through some kind of magical process to create something that intoxicates us. That front stomach contains an enzyme called Rene. I don't know when this was isolated, like yeast, but I imagine it was around the same time as yeast in the 1800s. It was naturally cultivated using stomachs or parts of stomachs for thousands of years before then. Okay, so this Rene curdles the milk. This produces curds and whey. Curds are the solids that eventually become cheese. Okay, so I kind of knew most of this, but I didn't really know the science. Feel free to read the entire Wikipedia entry on cheese to know more. The link is below. Now that we know the basics, and I do mean basics of cheese making, let's talk about the differences of cheese. So like other products like wine, the source material, and the location can make a difference. Or not, depending on how controlled or manipulated the product is. Like wine, the type of milk is crucial to the final taste and aroma. Also, cheese is affected by what the animal eats. The types of grass or other fodder will affect it along with the time of year. In some places like Switzerland, where you have animals that can graze at different altitudes, the types of grass at different altitudes will produce differences within that cheese style. Add in things like aging, curing, washing, smoking, etc., and you'll get thousands of different types of cheese. Again, this is an oversimplification, but it's fairly accurate. So what makes Gruyere Gruyere? And this brings us back to the reason the email was sent out in the first place. In January of 2022, a U.S. district court ruled that the term Gruyere has become, quote, generic to Americans. 
Everything I read says that the French and Swiss makers of this cheese plan to appeal the ruling, but I didn't find anything. A couple of things. French? Yeah. So there is also a French version. In the whole first debate, the Swiss were decidedly first having made this style of cheese since 1115. Another reason they should be protected. Also, the name for the cheese, well, it only comes from a town called Gruyères in Switzerland. Well, with that said, both have a protected status, but the French one is considered a lower level. I'll get to this in a minute. But the real issue here to me is the, quote, generic part. Champagne and Burgundy have fought for almost 100 years to protect the names of their wines. Chianti also to a lesser extent, but it's still the same. In the U.S. for decades, the terms Champagne, Burgundy, Chablis, and Chianti were used for wines. The American consumer associated these terms with a style. Most of the time, these wines didn't even use the grapes associated with the originals. Now, Champagne especially has been affected as the average consumer calls all sparkling wine Champagne. I literally hear it dozens of times a day. Old school versions of this are also a, calling a copy a Xerox or a facial tissue a Kleenex. Even so, wineries are not allowed to use these protected names unless they were grandfathered in, and those are very few in number. Brand names or similar get co-opted to describe other products that are close enough to the average consumer to be, quote, the same. So this ruling, in my opinion, could be a way to allow other products to use protected names. So in the EU, wine isn't the only thing with PDOs or protected designation of origin or PGIs or protected geographical indication. Cheese, meats, olives, olive oil, beer, bread, spirits, etc. can have them. But even in the EU or Europe, a, in a broader sense, there have been cases where a local name for a wine or a grape was the same as the original. Those had to be worked out in agreements usually favored who was, quote, first. Same with other products. The French Gruyere is considered a PGI, which is a lower tier protected designation. I'm sure it's because the Swiss version is the OG, you know, the original Gruyere. Oh, okay, I see what you did there. Besides European nations signing international trade agreements to recognize these protected names, most other countries also sign them and follow them, most of the time. But exceptions happen, like in this case. Okay, in Switzerland, there are 12 AOPs or Appalachian d'Origin Protégé for cheese. They are Berner Alp Case and Berner Hobel Case, they're, they're considered together, Bloder Sour Case, Emmentaler, Glarner Alp Case, Le Gruyère, Le Tavaz, Raclette Duvalet, Sibrins, Ticino Alp Case, Tête de Moines, Vacheron Fribourgeois, Vacheron Mont d'Or. So obviously, Gruyère's is one of those AOPs, but what makes Gruyère the Swiss kind special? It comes down to terroir and tradition, just like wine. Real quick though, know what's missing? Swiss cheese, you know, the holy kind. It's on the list though. It's the Emmentaler AOP. That's another term that may also get used in the EU, but they have to specify that it's not Swiss. That's the same thing for the French Gruyère. They have to say French Gruyère. While Pinot Noir from Burgundy is very much unique, you can make a Pinot Noir wine that is close to it or not. And while people do exist who can tell the difference from people like me or other industry people and even wine connoisseurs, we can get fooled. But more importantly, the average Joes are more easily fooled or just don't care as long as they just taste good. I'm on the side of the Greer peeps here, by the way. So in Wisconsin, it seems to be the place where most of the American version is made. But Wisconsin is no Switzerland. They're kind of close in latitude, but Wisconsin is a full two to three degrees farther south in latitude. And they don't have an alpine terroir or climate. Now don't get me wrong, they make some really good cheese as a category, but they're just not going to be able to truly and naturally replicate Switzerland. Now, at least Willamette Valley kind of looks like Burgundy. Okay, not quite, but the soils are different a little bit, and the climate isn't quite the same, but it's close, and they're roughly the same latitude, and there are similarities, you know, enough of them in Willamette for the Pinot to act like a Burgundy, well, at least to most people. Now, let's break down the process of making Gruyere. Well, first comes the milk. The cows need to come from the Gruyere AOP. This geographical region consists of the cantons, kind of like the equivalent to a state of Fribourg, where the actual town of Gruyere's is, Vaud, Neuchâtel, and Jura and several communes of Bern in the west and northwest of, of the commune of Bern, or I'm sorry, of the, of the canton of Bern. Now, while 
much of this area looks flat. It's still at an altitude of about 2,000 feet or higher, plus the actual mountains that go as high as 6,000 feet or so. Now, throughout the AOP is a mixture of different types of agriculture, including vineyards, plus plenty of grassland for the cows to graze. Oh yeah, this is a cow's milk, by the way. In the summer, they graze or on fresh grass, while in the winter, they feed on hay. Speaking of vineyards, there really aren't that many, but I'll cover that in the next video on Swiss wine. Look for that next week. Okay, so twice a day, the dairy farmers deliver milk to the cheese dairy they are assigned to. That's how the official Gruyere website puts it. I'm guessing like wineries, these cheese dairies have contracts with the farmers to supply the milk. The website also points out that the grass and hay don't have any additives or ensilage. Now, translation, that they just means they eat regular grass uh, or regular hay and not a feed that was put into a silo, aka ensilage or silage or silage. I'll let you go down that silo rabbit hole, but essentially doing ensilage increases milk production. Now, whether that's good or bad for quality, I'll leave it up to someone else. There's another link below for that. As far as additives, what they feed the cows is not loaded with other types of nutrients or other kinds of enhancements. And there really aren't any additives. I'll just put it that, I'll just put it that way, okay? Next step, the morning milk is combined with the evening milk in a copper vat. The evening milk has been settling during that time. Starter cultures from the whey are added to mature the milk. No different than having your own starter cultures for other products that you're probably producing in house. The Rene is then added from pieces of stomach to get the milk to curdle. This takes about 30 to 40 minutes. This curd mass is then cut into granules by what is called a cheese harp or a tranche caille in French. After this, the contents are heated to about 135 degrees Fahrenheit or 57 degrees Celsius for about 40 to 45 minutes. Up until this point, no heat has been used. For the record, this is not pasteurization. That's at a much higher temperature, but for a very short amount of time, and then quickly chilled. At no point is the milk pasteurized, nor is it allowed in the regulations. Raw milk is a requirement for this cheese. During this heating process, the granules are about the size of a, of a wheat grain. The cheesemaker will then grab handfuls of granules and knead them into a mass to check the texture. Next, they put the entire contents, curds and whey, into round molds. These molds will have a stamp on them to indicate the Le Gruyere AOP, along with the cheese dairy number. The whey eventually runs out and is collected in a basin to be reused later. After that, they stamp the curd mass with a casein marker that also has the cheese dairy number and the number of the wheel itself. Casein is a natural protein from milk, so it's not considered an additive. It's also used for fining wines. The wheel is then pressed for about 20 hours. Now the next day, the cheese wheel is removed from the mold and is put into a 22% salt brath or brine for 24 hours. This acts as a preservative and the maturation process begins. These are stored for the next three months at the dairy, and, is the, and this is where the protective rind begins to form. This rind is called a smear, or morge in French. The next step is final maturation. In most cases, the wheels are sent to an affineur for the affinage stage, or cellar aging. In some cases, for many cheeses, the actual dairy can do the affinage, but it seems like this is not the case here. This part of the process is not exclusive to Gruyere, but is common throughout Europe. Really, all this is so far pretty standard for cheese, at least in what is considered an artisanal style. Maybe some don't get the stamping or numbering, but usually there are some kind of markings on the cheese or the wheel, especially if there's an AOP involved. This cellar aging is done at 90% humidity and 59 degrees Fahrenheit or about 15 degrees Celsius. The humidity is important to prevent the cheese from drying out. The wheels are turned over and brushed with salt water regularly during this time. It also helps to develop the rind. The affinage will last anywhere from 5 to 18 months or even longer. There are two aging levels of Gruyere, classic, which is 6 to 9 months, and reserve, which is more than 10 months. And you won't really see the word classic on there, it's just Le Gruyere. The regular AOP, or quote classic, should have a soft and refined taste that is a combination of sweet, savory, and a little salty. The reserve should be full-bodied, fruity, intensely flavored. There's also a subcategory called Gruyere Dopage AOP. This is cheese made from May until the beginning of October. There are about 50 dairy farms with mountain pastures that are the source of the milk. The cheese is made on site and then, um, then the affineur immediately takes the cheese for aging. I've linked to the English version of the AOP regulations for you to check out, but here are some additional highlights. Now the aging number is only from the cellaring. It's a given that there were three months of aging at the cheese dairy. Wheel size and weight are regulated. Hole size, texture, and taste are regulated. 
fat, water, and salt content must meet certain criteria. 70% of the cattle's forage must come from the farm. The diet is regulated based on summer or winter and only certain foods are allowed other than grass or hay. There are no growth hormones, additives, or preservatives other than salt allowed. Milk is used within 18 hours after milking the cow. Max distance of the milk source to cheese dairy is 20 kilometers or about 12.4 miles. All milk is traceable. Each step in the process is defined and regulated. The product is appraised actually three times to ensure it meets the required standards. Here's some other info. There are more than 1,800 approved milk producers. Each farm has about 30 to 50 cows, more than 150 approved cheese dairies, and only 11 approved affineurs. All right, I don't have any stats or pricing per se for these cheeses. I was not given a producer name, dairy, or affineur. It appears, though, that the affineur is who would be, that, that name would be on the label. Now let's get into the cheese. All right, so super excited about this. Um, so I got these cheeses. Today is the 19th of February. Oh, yeah, by the way, if <laughs> continuity, continuity error, if you've been watching the episodes so far, you'll see, you'll, you'll notice that, uh, well, one, I have more hair and I uh, don't have a Van Dyke. That's what this is officially called. Um, I'm recording these, recording th this series of, of episodes after I recorded all the wine episodes a few weeks ago. So when we get finished with this series, you're going to see me back again with no facial hair and more head of hair. Anyway, it was time to get a haircut. I was being lazy. It was super long and annoying me. And I just, and when I recorded all those episodes, I was on vacation, so I don't shave. And I had a full beard and I was like lazy and I just cut it to this. This will probably go away at some point. All right. So like I said, there's two different types of cheeses. There's classic and then there's reserve. Now, um, had thrown out all the, the wrappers and all this stuff. So the wrappers might have said the affineur on there, but the information I have, the, the, the paper I had did not have any of that type of stuff. But, um, so I'm going to try to put this up. This is the classic or the regular one. It, you can tell can the rind just has a, a good color to it. It's, it's, just like a brownish orange. It doesn't look like there's any like aging to it. it. Doesn't look like, I don't know, moldy or dirty. Now this is the reserve and you can see the rind looks like it's like it's older. So I emailed them. I emailed the person who sent me all this. Uh, and I was like, Hey, I just want to make sure that I got it right. And she goes, you got it right. All right. So let's, um, and now I talked about hole size. Now the, here's the thing. Gruyere really doesn't have holes but they can have a little cracks and um, other cheeses are like that too. All right. So we're going to try the, yeah, I got the fancy stuff out. We're going to try the um, regular one. Tastes so good. So I'm obviously not a cheese reviewer, cheese, cheese critic. So my, my descriptions of the cheeses may not be exactly um, um, great, but there's a great, there's a good creaminess to it. It's a, it's not a hard cheese. It's a, I think they call it a semi-hard cheese. Uh, it's got a good flavor. It's got a good milkiness, a creaminess to it. Um, I would, they talk about being fruity. I guess there's a bit of fruitiness to it. I would maybe kind of put this in the, in the stone fruit type of category, like apricot. If I'm really trying to think about cheeses, um, maybe like a peach type of thing. I really wouldn't put this in the citrus side of things. I wouldn't put this in the tree fruit like apples and, and pears. However, I could see really apples and pears being a perfect pairing for this. Um, yeah, apples and pears would be great with this. So while it doesn't have that apple-y necessarily flavor, um, I think it has that. There is a, a little bit of grassiness to it. Um, there's a freshness to it. There's a youthfulness to it. I mean, that's, it should have this type of stuff. Uh, it's super delicious. One of the things that I didn't talk about in all the stuff is this is apparently great cheese to melt. So I could imagine having this like uh, as a grilled cheese sandwich, or if you, you, if you're going to melt cheese on top of say like a chicken dish or, or, uh, or burger, that'd be great. Oh, the rind is edible too. I mean, they didn't say that specifically, but the rind's edible. So you don't have to worry about that. All right. When I got the cheese, unpacked it, 
it was shipped directly from from, from Switzerland. Uh, had like a protective box and had like the little, you know, uh, the portable dry ice pouches that you can refreeze if you want to. Um, and it said, we take them out, wrap them in like a dishcloth. So that's what we did and put them in the quote crisper of your refrigerator. So we did that and they've been sitting in there until today. And uh, I took them out a little bit, about an hour before I was planning on doing this. They suggested to take them out for about an hour. That way they warm up to the point where you are, where you can really evaluate them very well. So you don't want them like ice cold. That that's the point. It's like it's like drinking a white wine ice cold or a red wine like too cold. We're going to get to these, but not in these episodes. All right. So so yeah, um, there's a youthfulness. It tastes really good. Um, I can totally see this as a, um, a cheesy melt on a burger or something like that. Pretty nice. I'm also recording during the day, so you might see some. Yeah, it might be there. I tried to block it out, but my blocking mechanism is not staying up. All right, so let's do, that's so good. There's also this kind of, I don't wanna use the word musty, but like this earthy, there's earth, a little bit of earth to it, okay? Yeah, a little bit of earthiness, almost like a mushroomy quality to it. All right, this one feels like it was a little bit harder to cut. All right, so this is gonna be the reserve. All I know is it's at least 10 months. Now, typically 10 to 18 months, so they could go up to 24 months. I highly doubt I have a 24 month aged cheese. This is probably right around that 10 month period, but I'm no expert. So the first thing I know is besides there's a less fresh taste to it, is it's crunchier. There's like more crystals in there. And that's, I know that's one of the things that cheeses when they age will do. They get, they get a little crunchier because they're, they're still, you know, they're, they're maturing and they're changing, kind of like a wine does. It's more earth driven. It's not as fruit driven. I feel like you've got a little bit older mushroom type of quality to it, a little more earthiness, a little more, um, I want to say desiccation to it. I know it sounds bad, but I mean, I'm just equating this how I would, how would, how would describe a, a wine with a little bit of age. I mean, I would imagine this is the equivalent of a, of a wine that might be eight to 10 years old. Um, cheese probably, you know, matures faster. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, this is probably going to go great with these wines. Well, I mean, this probably go really well with the wines too, but I can see doing this with a white, I can see doing the first one with a white wine and this one with a red wine. A fun fact, you can do a lot of cheeses with white wine. We, we tend to think red wine with cheeses, but white wine is a great pairing with, with, um, with cheese. Um, there's a more complexity. So, I still have the, the, the stone fruit thing, but instead of the apricot, it's more of a peach, but it's, it's a um, kind of a riper peach or an overly ripe peach type of thing. Not that it's sweet, but you've got that kind of quote, not quite rotten, but it's like, it's kind of, yeah, you, you, needed to, you needed to eat it. Maybe use it like in, instead of eating it fresh, you like put it into like some type of, of um, bake it or whatever. Yeah, it's more like that. It's more like it's uh, it was baked, not rotten. That's a bad word. Oh, I like the rind. The rind has a little bit of character to it. It gives you almost a, not quite smokiness, but this um, kind of I don't know how to print, I don't know how to describe it, but just more complexity to it. it, it, it it's more it's dusty. There's a more dustiness to it. Let's have the rind of this other one here, and then we're gonna wrap this up. Hmm. So the rind on, on the classic or the regular one is really aromatic. It's fresher. Yeah. These cheeses are great. So I have to thank, I think it was Jesse. I think it was, yeah, Jesse. Jesse, thank you so much. If it wasn't Jesse, I'll put her, I'll put her name on the, on the lower third, but almost positive it was Jesse. Um, so Jesse, I want to thank you for reaching me out, reaching out to me about uh, doing some cheese. I've had Gruyere in the past, but you know, it's been a while. It's great to revisit this. I'm excited to try these with these, with these wines. Uh, both from Switzerland, and just enjoy them just in general. Um, like I said, I'm on the side of the Gruyere people. This is something that's unique, at least this version, to Switzerland. I guess the French have their own version, and they have these actual protected names. I get it. Swiss cheese has become a generic term. You know, uh, cheddar is a generic term. I get that people kind of associate Gouda as generic. Um, 
and Gruyere. To me, good is more generic term than, than Gruyere. I mean, to me, I always, it's Gruyere, it's Gruyere. Like it should come from the one I thought France, but now I know Switzerland, not that there's American Gruyere or Gruyere's from other countries because there are. Um, but yeah, this is the OG. And uh, if you see it, you should get it. All right. So that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, now, if you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and uh, tell your friends. And uh, we'll see you next time with some uh, cheese. Actually, next time will be a, a deep dive into Swiss wine. So you'll put your thinking caps on. This is going to be like really deep, deep, deep. But after that, we're going to pair some wines. Later. What was that? Later. <laughs>